You are listening to the Thinking Effect podcast with Orsul Green and Lillian Kriegler. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 17 of the Thinking Effect podcast. And this episode is all about how can teachers leverage play to enhance learning? And it linked beautifully and flowed beautifully from our previous episode, episode 16, which was all about how can teacher create space for curiosity? And the reason these two episodes are tied nicely together is because play enhances curiosity. And a curious mind is a mind that wants to learn. But before we jump into it, let's say hello to Lilian. Hello, Lilian. How are you? Good morning, Ortel. I thought I'd say something different today than hey, Ortel. <laughs> You know, play is one of my absolute favorite topics, and I've devoted many chapters in my book, Educameleon, to play. And also, it's the year of play. So teachers everywhere are probably scratching their heads saying, look, we know children learn through play, but how and what do they learn through play? Because there are different kinds of play, aren't there? Absolutely. There are many different kinds of play, like freeform play, and you can play to teach social and emotional skills. But in this episode, we want to focus on structured play, on how you can use structured play to teach your curriculum in a fun and engaging way. That's right. You know, having free play, which we call it in the early years, is fantastic for students because they you know they they communicate with each other they try out out ideas they put on different roles there's so many reasons why you know leaving children to play is fantastic um but within that play you know they will spiral up to the probably the highest level of all of their knowledge and experience and skill so we don't want to leave children in there, um, you know, if we have things in the curriculum that they still need to get to. So this is where we need to just d- distinguish between what is absolute free play, which is valuable, believe me, it is. But then also to have teachers understand um, more in greater detail what kinds of structure they can place um, in, in, in position to ensure that children are learning through their play above where um, and along with the kind of free play that goes on. Absolutely. And I want to add to what you said, you mentioned early year, and it is very broadly acknowledged today in the world that play is very important in early years, so much so that the United Nations actually lists play as one of the basic rights of children. So it's great that this is acknowledged as a great uh, tool for to develop uh, children, that children need to play to um, grow and develop. But I think it's less acknowledged uh, how important play is for older children and even adults. We all need play. It's very important to our development and our ability to learn at, at any age. You, yes, that is it's very, very true because... What happens then is it takes away the serious element of having to get everything right. You get also in play a kind of flow, a kind of brain flow that you don't get in other kinds of um, thinking and endeavors. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's, it's a different kind of involvement and a different kind of thinking because often you're making it up as you go along. Or, you know, you, you're um, checking in how are you feeling about it. And, you know, you, it, it, it's a really, really different thing from normal kinds of thinking. Absolutely. And you know what? We are born to play. And, and looking, you know, at animals in a broad, at the big picture, all animals play to learn. I mean, if you look at um, baby, um, you know, lions, babies, they play to learn. They play to learn how to hunt, how to uh, protect themselves and so on. So it, it's, it's our basic way for us to explore the world around us and to do so in a, in a safe manner. So we can try and fail and learn from it in a very safe way. True. And, and you know, that young 
animals do it. You know, my daughter's uh, little French bulldogs have just had puppies, oh, wow. seven beautiful <laughs> puppies, and they are not even walking, but they're trying to run. And they are playing with a ball. I could not believe my eyes. They're not even, you know, t- seven weeks older. They they are doing that. So it is it is so true. And babies are exactly the same. They want to play. And, you know, adults, there's a huge, massive gaming industry. We love to play. So playing with ideas is where we have to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the, apart from learning through play, which is great, and our brain actually develop more connection as, as we play and learn, it also helps us reduce stress and anxiety. And you mentioned adults, we all um, turn to play to help us relax, like playing golf or basketball or playing computer games, as you know. So it's, it's a great way to relax, come down and have fun and learn while you do so. Yeah, so I mean, that's a, the what. It's very, very important and it's, it's everywhere. So, you know, we want to then talk a little bit about the structured play. So you don't want instructor play to remove all those fun elements. But, you know, you still want the children to engage freely with materials, but there's more structure and thought around what you're providing, why you're providing it, and and then also what you're looking for and how to support that play. So you're kind of mediating or guiding the play in some way. So, you know, for instance, often in a, in classrooms, you'll see children building um, towers with blocks and that sort of thing. And, you know, sometimes the block tower falls over and sometimes it doesn't. And so with so you're putting those blocks in there because you're understanding the physics of what blocks do. You know, you understand the physics of a good base, the physics of... Um, shape and build and and pressure and force and all those things you understand that as a teacher you also understand um the physics of things falling over (laughs) but you want the students to understand that and to be able to articulate that so you've provided the resources because you're aware of their potential for learning in physics and maths and then you want them to say why it fell over. So one mediational thing in structure plays, you ask them, oh my goodness, why do you think that fell over? And get them to think about it and explain because then it goes beyond that like free play and it's not going to stop them from trying again and it's not going to stop stop them from involving themselves, but it's going to push up the level of understanding, the conceptual understanding. Oh, we need a good, broad, base to work on or you know we can't put a big wide block on top of skinny narrow block and that articulation and that understanding and injecting language so if the children don't have that language this instructor play is a perfect perfect place to inject the language um, so that that play becomes um, more meaningful and and the understanding around it is deeper Yeah, absolutely. I agree. You need to be intentional about how you structure the play and what your objectives in terms of what you want them to learn. So your example about building tower, this is a great way to for children to learn about um, gravity, balance, cause and effect, different materials. And you can add additional things as per your curriculum. For example, if you want them to learn about different ways to measure, for example, then you can instruct them on how to measure how tall is the tower or how to measure different things. Or if you want them to explore different materials or geometrical shapes, you can include that as well in that exercise. And, and I love what you said about um, learning through the process because the best way is to um, actually observe what you're doing and, and take notice about it. So for example, if you split your students into groups of two to three uh, students and ask them to build the tallest tower they can, before they start building with their hands, they need to plan and design the first tower they want to build. So you can ask them to draw on a piece of paper 
the tower that they want to build and and why why they want to build it in this way what do they think is going to happen and then you ask them to actually build that tower and observe again what's happening so what happened once you actually build the tower you designed did it work uh, what didn't work and why do you think something didn't work and you gave an example of maybe the tower tipped over because uh, the foundation wasn't wide enough and so let them learn through that process of play and document their learning and once they finish with one design they can move to the next design and and you can challenge them to say um compete with yourself see how um the tallest tower that you can build as a group and every time do this observation and write down and then obviously share with with your classmates share your learning with your classmates and and as you said this will give them the language the vocabulary to use to express the learning and it's also going to help them to galvanize this learning to really internalize what they learn through their play yeah yes that's a really great commentary on on how it happens in the classroom and you know when you're doing that the learning happens in different um areas so for instance you know when you when you're asking that they have discovered this through action so then you can ask them questions related to emotion you know was it frustrating or, or get them to explain how it felt so the emotion is one part and they can unpack that because that's really helpful for um, coming across other problem solving tasks later on and getting, you know, getting a sense of what is frustration, what is perseverance, what is stick to itiveness. But then there's also, as you mentioned, the content learning, the language, understanding the concepts. Um, and then there's a skill level as well. So what did you have to do? You know, what skills did you need? And so they're different. And I think it's really great if educators can focus on and understand, not just ask many questions, but to what category, <clears throat> what category of question are you asking? Are you asking a skill question, an emotion question, a content question, um, a transfer question? Like where else would you use this information? Because you know how much I love transfer. Yeah. So I love, I love teachers to be able to really understand with the structure how they categorizing the information for the students. Absolutely. And to add to that, you know, by letting them work as in small group with as two or three students uh, and, and design together and decide together, okay, how are we going to design it? Then they learn a lot of things about collaboration and resolving con conflicts and difference of opinion. So that's another layer for the learning in terms of how do you work as a team member? What do you do when you have a disagreement within a team? How do you solve it? So you can discuss that as well with your student because there is a lot of learning and a lot of um, developing important life skills just by doing this um, play exercise in your classroom. Yes, I love I love that social layer that you've added to all of that. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, benefits. Uh, and as you can see, it's easy to incorporate play into your curriculum uh, in many different ways. Again, your imagination, um, I mean, you're only limited by your creative thinking and imagination because any topic within your curriculum, you can actually add to it some element of play so your students will benefit from that. Yes, I love that, that you talk about the imagination because you know we've spoken and people are gonna think we're talking just concrete materials. But really, a lot of the time, the play is in the conceptualization, and then you make models. So yes. it can happen the other way. You know, we're saying play with materials, and then the learning emerges. But actually, sometimes when you you conceptualize first, and then you introduce the materials, and you make your um, your different iterations and different models, then you can learn more about you know what is going to be the most successful idea. So Absolutely. yeah, it can happen at a concrete, but also a very, very abstract level. Absolutely. That's right. <laughs> okay, so shall we summarize? Yes, please. All right. So play is a crucial form of learning for all um, creatures on the planet, in fact, and especially for human beings at every age. Play is a place where things are not serious and there's a special kind of flow in the engagement. Now, why it's important 
is that it gives the students this freedom to experiment to actually observe what happens by themselves we don't have to tell them so you know they don't feel like they we are imposing our ideas or our learning on them they are discovering for themselves and that instantly makes the learning sit longer and be much more memorable and the how is to offer opportunities in the classroom for structured play as well as free play so choosing your materials wisely choosing um, the, the questioning around it, your mediation questions very wisely, and then getting children to record and explain and talk about what they have discovered through play. Absolutely, that's a wonderful summary. <laughs> Thank you, Lydia. <laughs> and um, have a go, give it a try in your classroom with your students uh, and let us know how, how it went. Tell us about your experiences, what kind of play you used in your classroom uh, and write to us to the thinking effect podcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from you. And next time we're going to continue with our play theme as episode 18 is going to be all about how can teachers teach algebra through play? which is very interesting. <laughs> oh, my goodness. My eyes are spiraling out already. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, we'll see you in the next episode. See you. Bye.